I thought about which Sahabiyya to talk to you about. And I want to talk about someone who's close to my own heart, someone personal to me, that I enjoyed reading about and talking about. I don't know if she would interest most of you here, or her story would be as inspiring as it was for me. But I think, inshallah, it's someone whom you don't often read about. I don't know if you've heard about this particular Sahabiya. Her nickname is Baraka. Has anyone heard of that name before? Baraka. Baraka radiallahu anha. No? How about Ummu Ayman? You've heard of the name Ummu Ayman. <laughs> but do we know who Ummu Ayman is? We know who Ummu Ayman is? Who wants to have a guess? Give me something about Ummu Ayman. Mistress? No, not mistress. Nice, nice try. Anyone else? Ummu Ayman? Naam. Who am I talking to there? <laughs> Brother's moving his mouth and making tasbih. I thought he's talking to me. Tadda Lakhi, what is it? Okay, we'll stop there inshallah. There's something like that. You're getting high marks at university, aren't you? Inshallah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the story I want to bring to you today inshallah, and we'll rotate around it with other things that happened around her, a little bit after her. Her name is known as Baraka, later on known as Ummu Ayman. The name Baraka is the only name we know of her. We don't know any other name. And subhanallah, it brings great sorrow to me that the Sira books don't emphasize a lot about her and we don't hear mashayikh and du'at speaking about her too much a lot of us don't know much about her but if I were to ask you this question would you like to hear about the first person in the entire universe who physically touched Rasulullah before anyone else you would say yes who is it the one who touched Rasulullah before anyone else on the face of the earth she is Barakah she is the first one to lay hands on Rasulullah when he was born. So let's tell us the story of this woman, Baraka, the woman of Jannah. She was an Ethiopian lady. Her origin is Ethiopian, Habashiya, like Bilal radiallahu anhu. Except that Bilal was known to be Bilal ibn Rabah. Baraka was not known bint who. We don't even know who her parents were. We don't know who her ancestors were. We don't know anything about her except she doesn't even know anything about herself, about her lineage. Subhanallah. She is Baraka and later on known as Ummu Ayman from Al Habasha, from Ethiopia. That's it. So she came from hundreds of years of slavery through her ancestors to the point where she doesn't know her lineage. In one time, she was bought in the market by who? by Abdullah, the father of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Abdullah. And you know, for someone to be bought, in those days slavery was universal. So they don't get confused. We don't have much of it today, but in those days it was universal. The Romans, the Persians, the Arabs, all of them practiced, there was slavery everywhere. They could not free them. If they freed them, there will be a, an epidemic of uh, public property happening. The slaves would have been killed, taken, raped, pillaged. So they couldn't free them. But the slavery was there. And slaves themselves couldn't free themselves. They didn't know where to go. They were afraid. The only way slaves could survive and meet and, and eat and drink and look after their children was to be slaves. To be bought and sold in the market, unfortunately. This was, an, this was throughout the world. But subhanAllah, for a slave to end up with a man such as the father of Muhammad Wasallam, a Qurashi, a Hashimi, one of the best of families known to the Arab world, Surely Baraka would have been a very special woman. From the point when she was bought in the market, she was an extremely special woman. Someone that was so dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but among the public, till today unfortunately, not very popular. So Abdullah bought her. She was only about 9 or 10 years old. Not more than that. She was a child. My daughter is now 8 years old, subhanAllah, look at her, she's a child. Nine years old, ten years old, estimate, because they didn't even know the actual age of children that time. 
estimated to be nine or ten years old. She was bought by Abdullah the fa ibn, ibn Abdul Muttalib. Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib was extremely generous, full of, you know, manners, very kind. He looked after Baraka as if she was his daughter. And Amina bint Wahab, the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she looked after her as if she was her daughter. Literally. And Baraka loved the company of the family of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam intensely. She didn't want to leave them. It was paradise for her. She loved Abdullah and loved Amina more than what she almost loved herself. And in those days, the rule was, if there was a slave of the family, she became, any, any other man became her mahram as well. So she can shake hands with Abdullah, she could be in the same room and take off her hijab in front of him when she became a Muslim, if she was, if he was at that time. So Barakah now was in the household of the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was the first slave of the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the only one. They offered to free her, but she refused. She wanted to stay among them, serving them and be among their family. She said, where will I go? Who can I find better than you? How can I look after myself? I'd rather be among you and everybody know that you own me. You are my masters. I'm happy to do that. You've got to take yourself 1,400 years ago to understand that. Okay, but this was a privilege. So Barakah was raised among them. There's one thing to note about Barakah radiallahu anha. She was, she hardly spoke. And this was something that Rasulullah later on said, among the people that fear Allah and the, that believe in the hereafter are the ones who say only the necessary words. Something that is good or they are silent. Barakah had this trait before Rasulullah even taught the people that, before he was born. She was also extremely optimistic. Anything that happened, she always interpreted it in a good way. When you're afraid, she was the one to make you feel peaceful. And Amina bint Wahab could not need anyone more than Subhanallah Barakah in her life. What happened? We all know the story of Abdullah. He just became married, so he had bought Baraka and he married Amina and she came into the family. Only in about a few months, Amina radiallahu an, uh, Amina bin Wahab, she became pregnant and she saw a dream. She saw a dream as though sunlight, nur, was emanating coming out of her belly, out of her abdomen. And it lighted up the city of Mecca all the way to Iraq. So she woke up and the first person she came to was who? Not her husband, Barakah. She said to her, Ya Barakah, come here, I've seen this dream. It lighted up throughout Mecca all the way to Yathrib in Iraq, Busra. What do you think this is? And Barakah's first words were this. She smiled and put her hand on her shoulder, saying to her, Ya Amina, Mum. She to call her mother. Ya Amina, my mother. Abshiri, have good tidings. This is a sign from above the heavens. You have someone important inside of you. The first woman to make this bishara, to make this good news. The first woman to work it out. In fact, the first person on the face of the earth to work out that there is an important man, more beloved and more special than anyone on the face of the earth to come out. Now we all know that the first person to make this bishara was probably Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather. She said, hide him, keep his, this dream a secret. Don't tell anyone. For if the people knew, they'll start growing jealous and probably plot for him. He knew the people of Mecca. But Barakah knew this before even Abdul Muttalib. And a lot of the, in, in the seerah we fail to find this. That Barakah is the first woman to recognize this and interpret this. And Abdul Muttalib, when he found out, the grandfather, he said to Amina, keep it a secret, don't even tell your family. Except your husband and don't tell your extended family. Yet Barakah knew, and he didn't care that Barakah knew, because Barakah was also a woman who kept secrets, as we said. Very short tongue. One thing about Barakah radiallahu anha, she was not a very attractive girl. She wasn't one of those who everybody looked at and said, wow. Her lineage was unknown as well. 
another downside to the people in those days. Not a downside to us. A downside to the culture of the people of Makkah. Yani. Who is this? Yet look at her status with Allah. Then came the day when Abdullah, the father of Muhammad Sallallahu was migrate. He was on an expedition going to Syria on a business trade. We know the story. On his way back, close to Syria, Abdullah died. And when the news came to Abdul Muttalib, he became very sorrowful, very sad. If you know the story of Abdul Muttalib and how many camels he had to slaughter in order to break his vow, when he made a vow that he will slaughter his last son for the gods and all of that stuff, you know, there's a big story about that. He sacrificed 100 camels to save his son because of a pledge he made, this Abdul Abdullah, and he was the youngest. So he was the most beloved and closest to Abdul Muttalib. So the grief of Abdul Muttalib was amazing. Now can you imagine Amina, his wife? She was left alone, widowed, not knowing, not seeing her husband died, far away near Syria, and she's pregnant. And she's sick already with the pregnancy, hearing about her husband Abd Abdullah dying. She was grieved for more than two months straight. Lucky she didn't, and subhanAllah, she didn't lose a child. Usually a woman within her first trimester, the sisters will know, in the first trimester, first three months, it's the most critical stage. A woman, if she is depressed or in anxiety or she is stressed out, she can lose her baby immediately. Yet Amina went through this extreme depression and sadness. Yet subhanAllah, her baby only grew strong. In fact, it made her strong. Who was there for her? Baraka. Baraka was there at the time of her extreme depression. She could have not gone through it without Baraka being there. So she was a therapist beyond any therapist today. Emotional therapist, psychological therapist, a therapist for anxiety, a therapist for depression, a very simple woman who understood how to give therapy to people to make them a calm and ease and at ease. <coughs> She'd earn big bucks today. What is it? She's a big therapist today because of the epidem depression epidemic we have and anxiety that we have around the world today. So Baraka said to her, Calm down. Wallahi, this dream that you had, remember, it is only good news. Allah is with you. They knew who Allah was. They worshipped Allah, but they worshipped alongside of them idols. You know, the idols they used to say, we don't worship the idols, but they bring us closer to Allah. Didn't they say that? So they didn't really take the idols as the God, but they were their gateway to God. So they really worshipped Allah, but through shirk. And Barakah said, Allah has a plan for you. This is what calmed her down. No one else said this except Barakah and Abdul Muttalib. Baraka nurtured her until the day came, about a month before her birth, the birth of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amina wanted to visit the grave of her husband. Till that point, she couldn't live peacefully until she visited the grave of her husband. That's how much love she had for him. And the romance between Amina and uh, Abd Abdullah is another story as well. So she said to Baraka, I want you to come with me. You're my only person who gives me calmness. I would like you to come with me and go with us too. I want to go to visit my husband's grave. She set off with her. Now, Baraka at this age was probably, the, the historians say, about 14 years old. Maybe 13 or 14. And Amina is over 20, close to 30 years old. A 13, 14 year old these days is a teenager who we call a brat. We say they're brats. Because I teach year nines. When we get to the year nines, you know, the 13, 14, Wallahi, as they say in Arabic, You want to make wudu, I make wudu in yogurt, they say. It's, a, it's this saying we, we say, and that I, I get stressed out. So 13, 14 years old, look how much wisdom and how much comfort she gave to a person who is nearly 30. A pregnant lady. Better than any nurse or midwife. She visited Abdullah's grave, and on her way back in a place called Abwa, a little bit of a distance from Medina, Amina bint Wahab became ill. And she sat inside, rented, they rented a hut, a little small place. And Amina began to become iller and iller. Now, I think I jumped the story a little bit, so I'm going to go back. Pulp fiction. Before that came, she had given birth to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when she gave birth to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Baraka 
was the midwife of Amina. There was no one else. She gave birth to Rasulullah Sallallahu Barakah carried Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakah cut, I'm sorry, there was no umbilical cord. She took Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and wrapped him up immediately and placed him onto his mother Amina to suckle. Barakah was the first one to lay eyes on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi The first one to touch him. The first one to see, to smile to him. The first one to make the following comment. O oh, Amina, Wallahi, he is more beautiful than the moon. Allahu Akbar, Ya Amina, I told you, your dream has come true. 